Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you, ladies, for coming. I appreciate it. My name is Nicole Hancock. I'm the dietitian in the outpatient services. So basically, all of West Tennessee Healthcare, like any outpatient nutrition services that there are, I take care of that. Um, I'm stationed over at Lyft, so you'll see me in and out of the hospital some. I do cardiac rehab here at the hospital, and then I teach the Healthy Heights classes as well too. Because if you were used to seeing Kelly a lot, um, Kelly moved to Arkansas. She recently, her family's there, so she just wanted to be a little bit closer to her family. So she's relocated, and I kind of took over all the Healthy Heights classes from there. So you'll see my face a little bit more often for the nutrition classes. Did everybody get a chance to sign in so I can get that to Tiffany? Everybody did? Okay, great. And we're going to talk a little bit about cholesterol today. To really understand cholesterol, we kind of have to understand where it comes from and how it promotes itself in the body. This is one of my favorite cartoons. With this new drug, cholesterol forms outside of the body where it can't clog the arteries. If we had that, we might actually be a little bit more worried about it. But we, reality is, whatever we don't see, and if we can't feel that it's causing a problem, we don't think it's there, or we don't worry about it oftentimes. It's not until we actually see a problem occurring with our daily lives or on the outside of our bodies that we find out, oh, maybe I should actually start looking at that and try and start doing something a little bit different. And so I like this one because if it did grow on the outside, you probably would want to do something a little bit different. But to really understand what you're supposed to do in preventative care, you kind of have to understand how do you even get high cholesterol in the first place? Oftentimes what I find in my practice is individuals come to me and say, hey, I was newly dosed with high cholesterol, high triglycerides. I don't understand what any of this means. I thought I was doing everything right. I was eating all the right things. And all of a sudden my lab work came back like this. And a lot of times they'll find that out in healthy heights. <laughs> in those lab work times and then they are wondering what do I do next? I don't understand because I thought I was doing everything correctly. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about how cholesterol just naturally forms in the body, how our diet forms it, and what are some of the reasons that we actually gain high, get high cholesterol at the end of the day. So you kind of have to understand the difference between tri cholesterol and triglycerides. They are two different things. However, they work together in the body to, for some of the same common goals. So oftentimes we'll see someone will come in, oh, I've got high cholesterol and high triglycerides, or I have one versus the other, and we don't know what to do, how do I change things? So we'll talk a little bit about that. But cholesterol is a waxy-like substance. Basically, if you held it in your hand, it would be very similar to a whitish, yellowish um, remnants of wax from a candle. So those little flakes that comes off, that's what it's really going to look like if you actually had to hold it in your hand. Triglyceride is a type of fat that circulates in the blood. Now these are both um, oil-based substances and your blood is water-based substance. So if you've ever put oil and water in a container, you swish it around, does it really dissolve? No, it doesn't. Well, neither does cholesterol or triglycerides within the blood, which is why we start to get them backed up. Because if you have a lot of cholesterol or triglycerides that are floating around your blood, they're gonna go and find each other. And they're gonna start making globs and forms, and then all of a sudden, we can't get blood through your artery anymore, and we wonder why. Well, triglycerides are ones that kind of floats in the center, Whereas cholesterol, a lot of times, will attach itself to the outside and, and it will pick up some of those triglycerides that are floating through the center of the artery. And so then we have a full blockage or we hear the words, we have a 60% blockage or 70 or an 80 or a 90 or 100%. And then we find out, oh, we need a stent because I've got to get something in there to open it up because I need blood flow. But right now it's preventing it from occurring. So those are the differences whenever you're looking at cholesterol versus triglycerides and how they're actually forming in there. So what do we do with these things? If they float through your arteries, but yet we can't, they're not gonna mix with your blood, they're just gonna attach to each other, there has to be some way to go through and take them and move them along to get them to do what they need to do. Well, there is, and that's called lipoproteins. The two main ones that we're gonna focus on are what you hear most often, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, or HDL and LDL. There are tons of lipoproteins in your body, so these aren't the only two, but these are the two main ones. And basically what they do is it's a combination of a lipid or a fat, the protein, and that binds the cholesterol and the triglyceride to make it all in one nice little package. And then that package is taken by either LDL or HDL, and it does certain things within the body. And we'll talk a little bit more about that to you. So low density lipoproteins, or LDL, we call them bad cholesterol. Um, the reality is it's actually not bad. 
LDL has a very, very important role in the body. And the point of it is, is that it takes cholesterol and triglycerides where it's needed most. Because cholesterol and triglycerides are needed in the body. You have to have it to function on a daily basis. If you had no LDL in your system whatsoever, you would, you would not be able to utilize cholesterol and triglycerides the way you need to because the whole point of LDL is to transport them to the various areas of the body where it's actually needed at. The problem is we have just too much of it going on and too much is where the problems start to occur with high cholesterol and high triglycerides. But LDL carries 60 to 70% of the cholesterol in your body throughout to be able to utilize with your cells, with your muscles and various things like that. Um, it, what it basically does is it drops off cholesterol in the blood, but if the LDL is too high, that's whenever it's going to just drop it in the blood. Otherwise, it's going to take it to the individual cells because every single cell is made up, that cell wall on the outside is made up of cholesterol. So you have to have it to keep your cells actually together and to form a full cell as well too. But again, if that's too, if there's too much um, LDL in there, then it doesn't know where to go anymore. It doesn't have a job anymore. It's like whenever you're putting together a party at home and you have a bunch of extra hands, and you're like, this is awesome, but what do I do with you? That's the exact same concept here. It doesn't know what to do. So it starts roaming around and figuring out, well, maybe I can do something here and I'll drop it here. Or maybe I can go over here and do it here. And we come to find out you don't really need that. Like your two-year-old who wants to, you know, come help you in the kitchen. And all of a sudden you realize things start disappearing in your making of whatever your product is. It's that same concept. So high density lipoproteins or HDL, this is our good cholesterol. The reason it's good, number one, it's a high protein combination. So it's mostly made of protein. So you don't have a whole lot of cholesterol and triglycerides and fat in there. The reason that's good is because its job is all of that leftover cholesterol and triglycerides that's floating around that got dropped in the blood it's gonna pull it out and it's gonna take it out of there and take it to the liver to do one of two things. It's either going to make it into bile acids and has a job in the body, or the liver is gonna repackage it and it's gonna excrete it out of your body. So you want HDL. That's why it's so important to have that number higher so that it can take anything extra floating around or doing anything any different in there. So this is just a good example of where HDL, how it does its job. So this is your plaque. This is where the problem's coming into play. So this is like your triglycerides and your cholesterol that's all built up. LDL takes more to it and drops it. Because again, like we had talked about, those two combine together. So anything that's extra of LDL, it's just gonna drop it off because it doesn't have a job to do with it anymore. All the other jobs are taken, but it has to do something with it. So its next step is just to drop it off in the blood. So we're just adding more and more and more, and this narrow, it starts to narrow shorter and shorter and shorter. Now HDL on the other hand, it comes in and it picks it up and it takes it out and says, well, you don't need it, so I'm gonna get rid of it for you and give it a job to do. But LDL didn't know what it needed to do. Do I just hit no, Cooper? So is cholesterol beneficial? Absolutely, there's three main things that cholesterol does. Assists in making the outer coating of your cells, very important, if that outer coating didn't exist, your cells would disperse and you would die. You would no longer exist. Your skin are cells, your hair is cells, so if it's not there, it can't hold anything together. Helps make bile acids. These bile acids are extremely important. That's how you digest your food on a daily basis. So if there is no digestion of the food, number one, you're gonna have a lot of stomach cramping. And number two, we're gonna see some of that weight gain and we're gonna see um, that occur because you don't have any way to break it down. You don't have any way to really um, do what it's supposed to do to get out of it what you need. So it has no other choice but to store it as fat. Um, also, vitamin D and hormone production. So the point of cholesterol, the estrogen and progesterone in your body specifically, it makes that. It helps in that production. If you didn't have it in there, you would not produce that. So as women, our bodies would not function on a normal basis as they're supposed to. So a cholesterol-free diet. If you went on a cholesterol-free diet, which really would be very, very difficult to do, and I can't even tell you that it would be 100% possible, but maybe for a couple of days, you still would have cholesterol in your body because your body makes everything that you need. 
for cholesterol. You need about a thousand milligrams and your body takes care of it. You actually don't need any more from your food and that's where the problem comes into play is that we eat too much in our food and we, to get extra in from our food is okay because our bodies knows how to filter that through and how to use it where it needs to and get rid of the excess. But whenever you overload it, that's whenever the problem comes into play because I have too much now and I've got to do something with it. Your body's motto is always, well, if I have too much, I either have to store it as fat, and this is of anything. This is of insulin, this is of cholesterol, this is of triglycerides. If I have too much, it's either gonna store it as fat or I've gotta figure out some way to get it out of the body because I can't use it anymore. So one of the two options is what you're gonna see. So the question is how? If I had no cholesterol going in my body, how am I actually going to make it in there? Well, you've got a couple of different sources. One is your food. Your liver is going to be the main one to do it for you and be able to make it. It probably makes about 75% of the cholesterol in your body for your body to actually use it because that's where your LDL and your HDL comes and goes from. Like they're kind of their central house is the liver. So if your liver's not working on a normal, regular basis, you can see how it can cause tons of problems with triglycerides and LDL and HDL because we actually don't have it to utilize and tell it what to do. So how does the body make it? Um, almost all cells, they need cholesterol to survive. So proteins in your cell and on the outside of your cell recognize the moment, it's, it's kind of like a little powerhouse in a factory. Oh, I'm getting low on something. So my supply and demand is out of whack right now. I need more to make sure that my cell wall is actually gonna be beneficial and can keep my cell together. So those proteins on the outside of your cell is going to say, well, I need more. So as it sees some floating by, it's gonna grab it up and utilize it and pack it together to finish making what it needs. So that's how your cells know, oh, I have too little or I have too much. Um, so in that aspect, your liver, as it's producing it, it's gonna be floating through and your LDL is taking that throughout your body and saying, oh, as I'm floating through this protein saying, oh, I need some cholesterol here. So that LDL drops that cholesterol off and goes away and goes get some more. And that's kind of the cycle. LDL picks it up, it takes it to a cell, to a muscle, wherever it needs, goes back to the liver and it just has a nonstop cycle as you're going throughout. So this is how food becomes cholesterol, basically. Because like we said, you can make it in your body. However, if you're going to get it out of your food, how does it actually occur and happen? Well, basically intestinal enzymes in the lining, they're going to go through and pick up those fatty acids or triglycerides. They're going to make any of that extra food that you're getting in, they're gonna make it into triglycerides for you. So as those triglycerides go in, then you actually have those dietary carbohydrates and protein that's absorbed through the liver as well too. All that's gonna package together and we're gonna make things kind of a big word, it's called chylomicrons. No one really cares what the word is, so we just call it the C. <laughs> so we're gonna make the C's and as those go throughout the body, they um, are made up of so many different things and the body is gonna utilize those to make um, cholesterol and make those triglycerides and again it's going to be packing all together and that LDL is going to come through and it's going to pick it up and say well I can use that so I'm going to use it where I need to. Where the problem occurs is the fact that you've got all this food coming in. What if you have too much and your body doesn't need triglycerides anymore? Because triglycerides are energy for your body. And what it does is it takes it and it drops it off in different places. A lot of times it'll drop it off in your muscles too because they need extra energy throughout the day. Well, it uses triglycerides kind of like its backup, its storage system, so that it can have energy in between your meals. So while so you've eaten, you immediately have energy, but what about those four, five, six hours that you have until your next meal? That's your next time that your body's gonna say, well, I need something else to get through to the next one. So it starts taking those extra triglycerides. Now, what if you have so much that by the time you get to the next meal, well, I'm kind of hungry. I'm still gonna eat something, but I'm not starved. Well, it's gonna store it as fat because it needs it there, but that's your backup energy for later. So that immediately goes to that storing energy. So high triglycerides, or high cholesterol, I apologize. Three main ways that you get it. One, the amount the body makes makes a difference. There are genetic components to where your body naturally makes extra. 
There's no rhyme or reason. It's heredit. It can be hereditary or there's a genetic dysfunction in your body where it can actually say, I need a thousand milligrams, but I'm going to actually make 1500 on a regular basis. So that's one way that you can get it. Can't really do a whole lot about that outside of medication because that medication is what's going to figure out how to pull that extra cholesterol out of your body so that you don't have to figure, so that your body doesn't have to figure out what to do with it. And a lot of times it'll do that by they're making more LDL to figure out where we need to go with it rather than drop it off in the bloodstream or get your liver to pull more out and get an excreted or make it as bile acids. Amount taken in from food. So if our body's making enough for us and we're getting extra in through food, there is a balance because you can burn that off through exercise and your body can make extra HDL so that if we can get that number higher, then that's gonna get out that extra anyways. And the number one way for HDL is exercise. And then the third is the amount successfully used or excreted from the body. So what if you make enough and you don't make too much, but yet your body doesn't re isn't really using it all, or it's not successfully getting it out of the body anymore? Both of those can also create high cholesterol as well too. Again, medication is a way that that would be able to um, eliminate that eventually as well. So triglycerides, we were talking about that this is your extra energy throughout the day. This is what's going to feed you in between your meals as well too. Too much of it automatically goes to fat. Typically where we get a lot of extra triglycerides or a lot of those extra food going in there that's converting into triglycerides are your concentrated sugars. So any of your candies, your desserts, your table sugars, your sweeteners that you do in drinks, things like that. Um, alcohol, red meat, and then increase in that exercise will also get rid of those as well too. Because if you exercise, your body needs more energy. So automatically your body's gonna use more of those triglycerides going in and being made within the body. So a couple of ways that we're gonna look at how we lower cholesterol. One is monounsaturated fatty acids, or we call them as short MUFA. You won't actually see monounsaturated fatty acids or MUFA on a nutrition label. You're gonna see monounsaturated, just that first word. And not all nutrition labels put them on there anymore. So anytime you see a nutrition label and you see the word total fat, five grams, saturated fat, 0.5, trans fat, zero. Is zero plus 0.5, five grams? No, it's not. So you know that there's four and a half total grams of fat coming from somewhere else. Well, they're coming either from monounsaturated fatty acids or poly or a combination of the two. The problem is, is that you don't, if you don't know what the ratio is, it makes it a little bit harder for you to choose some better choices, but at least you know, well, most of it's coming from those good fats, those things that my body needs. The reason we need them, specifically monounsaturated fatty acids, lowers LDL and increases HDL. So increases that lipoprotein that's going to take cholesterol out of your body and decreases the one that's going to be too high to where it's gonna drop extra cholesterol and triglycerides just into your bloodstream. So we want this. This is your number one fat to go towards. So if you're looking at a nutrition label and you're comparing and contrasting two products and you see this one has higher monounsaturated fatty acids than this one does, this would be my number one choice if that's what you're shopping for. So some sources, canola oil, olive oil, avocados, almonds, walnuts, those are some sources of them. You're gonna find them in a lot of things, okay? Your fish is gonna have higher ones in there. A lot of your leaner meats are as well too. So you've really gotta look at your nutrition label to see, well, am I getting good monounsaturated fatty acids in this? Is this a good product for me? Because don't get scared. A lot of times individuals get really nervous. They see, oh, it's eight grams of fat. I can't have that much fat, but they realize seven to the, of those eight grams is from monounsaturated fatty acids, that's an area that I would actually push you towards, even though it is a little bit higher in fat than some of your other products, because it's good fats. It's things that we need in our bodies on a daily basis. About 20% should come from MUFAs. So what that means is if you're eating 50 fat grams a day, I would want at least 20% of that 50 to come from monounsaturated fatty acids. 
Then we have the poly. The great thing about poly, they do lower your LDL, which is awesome. However, they do slightly start lowering your HDL as well too. So that's why we put this as our second best fat. So if you're looking at a ratio of your products and you see, well, my polyunsaturated fatty acid is actually higher than my mono, you might wanna try and flip that and maybe pick a different product if you're trying to compare the two. You're typically gonna find this corn oil, so soybean oil, sunflower oil, safflower, and a lot of your seeds are gonna have this in there as well too. About 10% is what we say coming from this. We definitely want the ratio twice as many monounsaturated than we do of poly so that we can get that HDL up and that LDL down. Saturated fat, we all know, this one automatically raises blood cholesterol levels. It's found in all of your animal products, your vegetable oils. Um, one thing about saturated fat, there's different types of saturated fat. Coconut oil has been a big hot item on the market right now and I've had tons and tons of questions about do I use it, do I not, it's high in saturated fat, I've got high cholesterol, what do I need to do? Well, there's different types, like I said, there's short chain, medium chain, and long chain triglycerides whenever you're looking at saturated fat. What we call medium chain, or you might hear it as MCT oils, actually a lot of research has shown that it will actually decrease heart disease and improve the situation. It actually will also improve Alzheimer's or dementia. It helps because Alzheimer's is, the best way to explain that is kind of like uh, diabetes of the brain. You're losing a lot of your glucose in there. Those MCT oils will actually replace that and make that connection go back together where you have better memory function for that. So there are some high benefits to it. Now, if you do have high cholesterol, or high triglycerides, I wouldn't say use it a ton a day, but it's definitely not one that I would tell you to steer away from on a daily basis. Trans fat, this is another one, anytime, always look, trans fat, they do not have to label it on the nutrition label if it's 0.5 grams or less per serving. That's the rule for labeling laws right now. So you can see zero trans fat or trans fat free and it actually still exists in the product. So you need to look at your nutrition label um, on the ingredients portion of it that's underneath the other part. If you see the word partially hydrogenated or hydrogenated, you know that trans fat exists in that product. It may be very small, but you also have to look at, well, how many servings am I actually consuming of this product to know am I actually gonna get some, a significant amount in? Um, this one, it does increase LDL and decreases HDL. And like I said, beware of that marketing, that zero trans fat or trans fat free, because it's not necessarily 100% the truth. So cholesterol made naturally in the body like we were talking about, but some sources of it you're gonna find pretty much all of your meats, fish, poultry, um, dairy foods, anything that's coming from an animal you are going to have natural cholesterol in. If someone came and tried to eat us, like we said, our body naturally makes it, so do animals as well too, so you're going to have it in there. You will not find cholesterol free in any of those products. If you do, I would highly be aware that it's probably not actually animal. <laughs> so make sure you look into that a little bit. Um, decrease low cholesterol, low fat diets. Um, high fiber will help as well too. Exercise is huge in it. Weight loss will improve it. Controlled blood pressure and controlled <coughs> diabetes will all improve a high cholesterol issue. Exercise, I loved this cartoon when I found it. His philosophy, exercise builds muscle. Muscle makes you want to show off your body. Well, to show off your body, you need a tan. Tanning turns your skin to leather. Cows are made from leather. Cows are fat, therefore exercising makes you fat. I loved this philosophy behind her. I thought it was hilarious because how far do we go to make an excuse to not exercise? He went pretty far on this. <laughs> he was not gonna go exercise. But we oftentimes get to that point. I'm gonna do anything humanly possible because I'm tired, I've had a bad day, I don't want to do it, I've got tons of housework, I gotta do the laundry. I mean, there's a hundred reasons that you can come with off the top of your head in five minutes for not to go and exercise. What I will tell you is there's been a lot of research come out um, about non-sedentary movement and your recommended amount per day of 150 minutes per week. That's the recommendation by the American Heart Association, by the Sports American um, Association College. All of them are saying 150 minutes per week total. That's what you need. However, the problem with that is, is that individuals who sit all day long, but yet they go and do their 150 minutes, they still actually do not have as great of a health condition as what we make it out to be. 
But the individuals who are the sedentary is you're sitting down or you're at a lean down position or laying down. That's considered sedentary. So me walking around, I am not sedentary right now. You, if you get up and go to the bathroom, you're no longer sedentary. You stand up, you're no longer sedentary because the moment just standing, you have to use different muscles just to stand. While you're sitting or laying down, you are 100% relaxed and are not using muscles unless you're trying to. So whenever they looked at, in a couple of different research studies that I'd seen recently, they looked at a, a sedentary individual that did 150 minutes per week, an individual who didn't do 150 minutes per week, however, they got up and walked maybe every hour for like five minutes, like they walk up and down the hall or to the bathroom or just got up frequently and did it, and then an individual who did absolutely nothing. The one that had the best overall labs and health condition was the one who did 150 minutes a week plus just getting up and walking every, every hour, 30 minutes. That allowed them to be active all day long, every single day. Whether it was I got up and went to the bathroom or I got up and went to the water fountain to get a drink, whatever that is for you and that ability, that actually showed the best health condition available. So it's not just enough to just do the 150 minutes per week, which is you can do that in five minute sections 10 times a day to get to that, or you can do it three times a week, 30 minutes. I mean, you can do it however you want to, but you have to look at what works best for you and trying to get both in is what's really gonna be the most beneficial. So recap, recap. cholesterol is necessary. You have to have it. Your body can't function without it. And a cholesterol-free diet is not going to take the cholesterol out of your body. You're still gonna have it in there because your body makes it. Cholesterol can be controlled, though, by diet and exercise. There are ways to make that and improve that. Everyone produces enough cholesterol, though, to function on a daily basis. So you don't ever have to think, well, am I getting enough? You're getting plenty because your body will take care of that aspect as well, too. Same with triglycerides as well. Your body's going to make it with that food that's coming in to be able to utilize for energy. That's part of that whole process. So does anybody have any questions for me? Yes, I think we'll leave everybody else does. Yeah. Um, my doctor had said um, that on the exercise, mm -hmm. that because I, I, uh, my office is at the end of the tunnel, and several yeah. times during the day I have to come, and I'm constantly mm -hmm. walking and all that. And um, she said, well, I need to do 30 minutes of exercise every day. Consistent. And I said, well, I'm up and moving, walking like 10 mm -hmm. minutes here and 10 minutes there. Does that count? And she said, no. And I had seen that. Mm -hmm. um, where you said that that still is beneficial, mm -hmm. so do you feel like that would be? Because I've Absolutely. seen that in several places, because sometimes it's hard to do it increments of 30 minutes, but Absolutely. I could do that other, so that still is yes. beneficial. Yes, yes. Well, the American yeah. College of Sports and Medicine actually came out recently and said that no, you don't have to do it 30 minutes together. Yeah. That it is still just as beneficial if you take that 30 minutes and do five minutes frequently. Absolutely, absolutely. Because for individuals, and I think a lot of it comes from the fact that if you don't have time to do 30 minutes, but yet you can split it up, that is much better than doing absolutely nothing. So while the ideal might be 30 minutes to get your heart rate up and working so that you can actually work your heart and work your muscles at the same time, I mean, so yes, yes, absolutely. If you're walking up and down nonstop all day long, Oh, it absolutely counts. Okay. <laughs> it absolutely counts. Did you say 150 or 15? 150 minutes. 50, uh huh. Yeah, minutes. Thought, yes, yes. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you, ladies, so much for coming. If you have anything else, let me know. And just make sure as long as everyone signed in, I'll get that to Tiffany. Thank you. Oh, okay. It's, it's right over here. You, you're welcome.